you know, I had two MC jobs in a row, meaning, and I say it like that because I didn't have to bring any gear. Oh, nice. You were strictly talent. Right. Uh, well, I'd like to think I'm strictly talent at all times, but I didn't have to hump stuff in. Um, I stepped into an already set up uh, audio support system for two different uh, events. One, right. one was very elegant. Um, it was uh, themed towards the royal wedding. For the National Association of Catering and Events. Oh, I saw that picture on Facebook. Uh-huh. Yeah, she looked very nice. Long uh, royal table for about 100. Mm-hmm. It was very, very cool. Wow. And then on Saturday, I was uh, MC for a, a hoedown country raucous party in the middle of New Prague, Minnesota. That's pretty cool. So did yeah. you get what you were worth? Yes. Good. I don't... <laughs> what That's... You... What you... That's fantastic. <laughs> Welcome to the Bill and Jason Show. Uh, I was Bill Herman. That's me. I'm Jason Jones, and this is it for uh, for another week. And uh, it's probably, you're probably wondering why I asked you. That's the first time I've ever asked you if you got what you were worth on this show. No, well, on this show, but you ask me that all the time, as if, like, you know, I give away my brilliant talent at any given moment, mm-hmm. which I don't. And so why would I ask you that? Why would I ask you if you got because what you were worth? Because we have on our show today... the were doing that and that did that was that something that kind of once you started that that stick with you did you did you decide because of that you wanted to be in radio or you wanted to be an actor or was it a performance bug what was it and how did it continue oh man uh it was really kind of a performance bug uh because i did uh stage in high school and that sort of thing uh-huh. i went to disneyland and Knott's Berry farm on stage um, but radio really was my first love, and that's what I ended up doing coming right out of high school uh, was radio. And then uh, from radio, oh my gosh, uh, ended up becoming a mobile DJ. Uh, really, uh, DJ, you know, disc jockey. Right. That's what I wanted to be. That's who I am. I'm nothing else. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I get that. I gained a reputation in Southern California as this outrageously priced DJ and uh, and so DJ started calling and asking how did we do it and I've been answering that question ever since so what had it that you ended up speaking that time when because I saw you that year at Mo- mobile beat that made such a huge impact uh, and ended up uh, buying these cassette tapes which now I have uh, 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 CDs uh, on, on your speeches and things like that. Um, what was it? I mean, what made that person say to have you come and do it? And, and did you think you were going to have the kind of impact that you had? No, 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 no. I mean, frankly, I didn't know what Mobile Beat was. Uh, I didn't know uh, there was uh, an association for DJs. Uh, Rebecca and I were just kind of doing our own thing and mm-hmm. making a pretty decent living. And we enjoyed 11 weeks off uh, for vacation every year or other pursuits. So we were doing fine uh, on our own, and uh, it wasn't until uh, a local association leader called me and asked me to come speak to their group that I became aware that we were an anomaly in the mobile DJ industry, and our so-called industry. <laughs> and uh, from that, that led to other speaking engagements uh, to other DJ groups, and then one DJ from one of those groups, and i sorry, I can't remember who it was, but they... Uh, wanted to get free passes to the Mobile Beat show, and so they signed me up to speak. <laughs> true, true story. And, I know. and did it work? Did they get their free passes? I believe they got their free passes. <laughs> the thing that, that really surprised me was how the lack of seriousness with which uh, the show and the DJs at the show uh, deemed speaking there it was kind Mm -hmm. of a big party for Mm -hmm. these guys at least this group that uh got me to go along with this right um but i take things seriously as as you might have guessed after 15 years Mm -hmm. so i worked really hard on the speech uh called getting what you're worth and uh and they made fun of me not unlike you know Rudolph and Reindeer Games. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, nice uh, seasonal tie-in. <laughs> well done. Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> they made fun of me. We were working so hard on the presentation. So, but I, I still didn't expect uh, the groundswell that happened. and uh, That was pretty amazing. I was, I was shocked and sleep-deprived and 
and, uh, and very surprised. Well, and it, that it ground goes, spell uh, turned into this, turned into the getting what you're worth tour. I mean, what made you go, huh, I wonder, maybe I should uh, become an advocate for this. What, what made you, what, what were you thinking? That's what I want to know. Oh, my goodness. Um, the clouds parted, the sun rays shone through, and there was a booming voice from the sky that said, Mark, you must advocate for DJs. <laughs> wow, that's what I thought happened. Yeah. <laughs> that's good to finally have the truth. <laughs> no, you know, uh, one of my mentors, uh, Tom Wilhite, said, find a need and fill it. And I think he was quoting Napoleon Hill. Um, but there was a need that was presented to me. It was is handed to me on a silver platter uh, by the emails and the phone calls that I received from DJs, not just in the United States, but all over the world. And I knew immediately that I was supposed to be doing something differently than I was doing before. I knew that uh, I had been a mobile DJ for 13 years and uh, successful at it. And I needed to expand that to other DJs to have more influence on other people's lives. And uh, I've been doing that ever since, uh, uh, what, 2003, I suppose. Wow. Say, so, you know, going back to when you actually, when you did set your rates, uh, back when you were, you and, and Rebecca were just starting off your entertainment company and you're deciding what to charge and what to do and what you are going to offer at, uh, because I mean, you're the originator of the whole idea of even doing the love story and you have the love story workshop now to teach people how to share that. But you... You did not come to you didn't come to the industry in the channels that DJs usually do come to the industry. It seems though you came from a, like a, a kind of a, a different background and a different point of view that seemed to inform like what you charge, what you would do, you know, and kind of opening up. It was kind of like you there was more possibility when you decided you guys were going to work together and create amazing things for uh, for people's uh, weddings. Maybe you could speak to that point of view a little bit. Yeah, it's. Um, I thought I was doing what most other DJs were doing. Frankly, I thought I thought most other mobile DJs had an entertainment background. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't have gone into this uh, this trade, this profession. Um, so, as I said before, I didn't know that there was any trade organizations or mm -hmm. groups, uh, meetings, and all that sort of thing. Uh, so I put to be uh, to put together a business plan, and it was based on earning my family income, and it was based on what I was paid prior uh, in, in both voiceover and uh, all the other entertainment areas that I played in. I mean, it's, uh, nightclub, voiceover, uh, acting, stage. Uh, I was paid very well and uh, at least union scale for most of what I was doing, so I brought that to to my mobile DJ business. You know, the value of a talent, you know, the value that talent brings. Right, right. So um, that's really how I came about it. It's like, okay, how many how many events can I do in a year, and what do I need to charge in order to make uh, the living that Rebecca and I had uh, become accustomed to? Mm -hmm. And uh, and wrote a business plan. It was a simple one. It was only a couple three pages long, but it was still a business plan, and it uh, gave a good outline for for what we needed to charge. And how did you decide what you were going to offer to do for them at their wedding receptions? I'm sorry, could you ask that again? How did you decide what you were going to offer to do for them at their wedding receptions? You know, it's because you came up with a lot of like new, completely out of the box idea, almost kind of reinventing the role of what the DJ would, would do, you know? Uh, yeah, I guess that's... what other DJs were doing. I didn't know what other DJs were charging. I did. I just assumed that they had the similar uh, background and mm -hmm. experience. So I didn't know I was doing anything extraordinary at the time when we were doing expanded personalized grand entrances and uh, the love story and uh, recorded uh, voice messages and, and all those types of things. Those were bits of entertainment that I picked up through radio, through uh, production work, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and my, my life in entertainment prior to being a mobile DJ. So transferring that to a wedding reception or another type of special event wasn't really a big deal to me. Uh, 
it was it was, it was natural and normal. And we took our cues from our clients. Hmm. You know, how can we make their experience better? I know you don't have a lot of time, but I mean, when Rebecca and I were married, it was magical. We were married on Maui and uh, in the Hawaiian Islands, and there was a network there that seemed to seemed to think or know already that we were getting married or that we had just been married, and and. People called us by name that we didn't know. It's like, how did you know? And so we very specifically went into the wedding business because we wanted our couples to have that same experience, that magical, floating, ethereal, mm -hmm. amazing experience. So when, we, when Rebecca and I started talking and asking, well, how can we do that for them? Things like the love story and the expanded introductions and, and uh, centering on... on the different ceremonial aspects of uh, of a wedding reception just made a lot of sense. We, they were our inspiration, not a desire to make more money, not a desire to compete with other DJs. Uh, we just put our customers first, truly, uh, in a way that uh, wasn't just an advertising slogan. Mm -hmm. So tell me about then, you must have had specific lighting packages and uh, specific songs you use for your introductions. Could you tell me about those? <laughs> this is where the real secrets come I know, right? This yeah. is the part I was waiting for. So, mm -hmm. so shh, let's, 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 let, let, him, let him answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> See, this is, I, I knew we shouldn't have See, done the gotcha keeping, question. He's keeping, is, he's keeping the stuff really close to his vest. I don't understand. His handlers are going to be like, no gotcha know, questions. Just quiet. Let's let him answer. I had uh, <laughs> I had many lights on my DJ booth uh -huh. so that I could see my paperwork right? <laughs> and knobs, but that was the only lighting I brought. Uh huh. But were they intelligent? You know, I like to think that everything has a certain amount of intelligence uh, given to it. Until he's been on this show. <laughs> Well, I mean, that's it's interesting, though. I mean, the reason I ask it is because that's what that's what I know that you get that question a lot. Tell me about what your packages were. How did you sell this to these people? What music did you play when you did this? I know you get these questions a lot, and and well, what I, I learned from you, that. right? When I what I learned from Mark is it it has nothing to do with all of those things, nothing yeah. at all. Yeah, it's it's the experience that your audiences have. Um, and I'm not saying that lighting doesn't add to that. It certainly does. And, and really expensive speakers and mm -hmm. all that. I think all I'm saying is those things aren't necessary to command a premium price. Um, and the, the, the object of the premium price in the mobile DJ world, really, <laughs> we're not talking about unlimited wealth. We're talking about <laughs> no. making a decent middle class living. Right. And uh, and so the comments about you know gouging people always kind of surprise me, um, because they're just sort of ignorant, you know, not, not the people necessarily, but the comment that you know charging somebody above three thousand dollars for an event is gouging. But yeah, I mean, no, we didn't have lighting, and and we didn't have special speakers and and photo booths and that sort of thing what marbecca extraordinary entertainment provided was a master of ceremonies music programming um coordination pacing for the event and planning basically so um those are pretty basic services mm -hmm. what made it different was how it was exercised uh, and that was uh, that's why our slogan is it's not what you do it's how you do it, because I do a chicken dance, you do a chicken dance, Macarena, Grand Entrance, the Love Story Now, a lot of people are doing that. Um, so it's, it's not the thing that you're doing that makes the difference. It's, it's really how you do that thing. And mm -hmm. uh, just like in voiceover, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Mm -hmm. It's not what you say, it's how you say it. Correct. It's not what you say. It's how you say it. 
See, now he's showing off. Yeah, yeah. He's just, uh, I like that about him. But, so. I think, well, you know, and, and just kind of hearkening back to, to what you said earlier when you were talking about you taking the cues from your clients and then always asking yourself the question, how can I make this a better event for my couples? How can I make this a better experience for their guests? Mm-hmm. How can I make, and if you're always asking yourself that kind of that question, then your creative answers are you know, are going to start, you know, coming in, especially when you come from the, the, you know, the talent background that you had and you're drawing, drawing from that rather than say, just saying, well, I want to be a DJ. So let me draw from what every other DJ does and just replicate that. Um, you just kind of came from like, I like wedding reception. You know, I like this experience. I want to create this for others. What can we do? And got creative and, and went with that. You're actually putting an advantage of not researching every other company to see what they're doing and then deciding what you wanted to do. Well, and speaking directly uh, to what the client wants. I mean, there's, I hey, when I first started, I saw it as a place for me to show off too. You know, the DJ shows up and, you know, he wasn't he wasn't a rock star, so he became a rock star. He got an audience. He didn't have an audience. He has one now. He can show what he mm-hmm. can do as opposed to having someone in their, in mind around what they are going to do as opposed to just having themselves in mind. And right. that, was a, that was a stepping point for me as well. As, and, and I think one of the reasons why people were so uh, enamored and surprised by his message because even pricing – had more to do with what they thought the client would pay him. Oh, sure. As opposed to what they were actually worth to that part of the event. And that that message was so foreign uh, to so many people in this, uh, as even Mark said, this so-called industry that's you know, still trying to define itself, that uh, um, that's why when people still hear the getting what you're worth message 18 years later, they're like, whoa, really? <clears throat> makes me crazy that it's 18 years and there are still people that go, wow, really? Well, I think it's fair to say, Mark, that, I mean, you, you could take that to a lot of industries where it would be like, whoa, you mean really? Like, you know, the whole value conversation, how do I be valuable enough for my clients to want that, that I can command a, the whatever you want to make for your business mm-hmm. or even think about what you're doing as a business? Yeah, I, I, I talked with a, a guy that uh, a big electronics uh, president in Silicon Valley, does a lot of business in China. And he was asking me about mobile DJs and what I did and, and uh, about my training and advocacy. Mm-hmm. And to be honest, I felt a, a bit sheepish talking with him about it. Really? Um, yeah, I did. I, 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 I mean, we're talking real money. We're talking mm-hmm. billions of dollars exchanging hands. And as I talked and as he grew interested, uh, I realized that, yeah, it is a message that, that uh, goes across the board. It isn't just applicable to mobile DJs. That was my passion, was mobile DJs. Mm-hmm. That's the reason I haven't taken it to uh, another group of, of business owners or professionals quite yet. But, but yeah, the themes are universal, absolutely. And... Um, and there's a lot of small and micro businesses that uh, owners that that struggle with pricing and struggle with com- uh, competition. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, I think the the most important thing for any business owner to understand is that competition is is in the middle of the bell curve. That's not where you want to be with everybody else. There are fewer customers and and far more providers in that bell curve. And so what you need to do is to work on these three things: talent. Caring and love, or TLC, talent, love, and caring. Caring isn't enough. You can care about your clients, but if you don't have the talent or the skills to give them what they need, then it's it's worthless. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have to have both the talent and the caring. And love just brings it to a brand new level. And that puts you out of the bell curve, out of the center of the competition, and into the 90th percentile. And once you're in that range, even at a a price that's five times higher than everyone else, what happens is that you'll find that there are far fewer uh, mobile DJs in that that 90th percentile and a lot more customers who want quality, Mm -hmm. who will spend the money to have uh, what what they desire for their events. Well, and how much of that is, is in being different, you know, differentiating, you know, not trying to sell, I'm better. 
I'm better than that guy. So you should pay me five times as much, but rather right. like, well, this is, you know, what the experience that we're going to create together is going to be different from working with ABC DJ company. Yeah. Um, or maybe not. So I don't know. What do you no, think? Being, being unique is everything. Uh, it's how can I, how can I even speak to this in, in a sound bite? It's, it's impossible to, um, Structure. <laughs> Cute Structure. elevator. Well said. Well said. <laughs> Structure establishes professionalism. Right. So that's where you need to know the fundamentals. How do you give a welcome? How do you give an introduction? How mm -hmm. do you do these things properly? And that kind of structure, it's not unlike playing a piano. You can be unique by just stepping up to a piano and, and just, you know, hounding on it. Mm -hmm. Right. You can be absolutely perfect self-expression. You can be absolutely unique, mm -hmm. uh, pounding on it. But it's not music until you learn the fundamentals. So you work on scales and you work on uh, chords and you work on, you know, we're using both hands, etc. That's the structure that establishes uh, professionalism in the minds of your audience. Mm -hmm. Then the artistry is what comes next, the expression of that. That's where you become unique as a as a master of ceremonies, as mm -hmm. a, a mobile DJ, uh, as an artist, as a performing artist. It's a term that I've been using for, gosh, 15 years as it applies to mobile DJs, which is kind of funny because uh, it's, it's now catching on. You know, it's, uh, but anyhow, that's, that's, that and was my take. And it, going back to some of your original questions is how did I treat my mobile DJ business mm -hmm. differently? This is how. This is that question that I've been trying to answer uh, for all these years. Uh, it's taken me around the world because DJs continue to ask the question, how did you do it? How did you mm -hmm. earn your family's income for 13 years straight, charging five times as much in one of the most competitive markets uh, in the United States? And if it were just one answer, if it were just, it's this, thank you very much. Well, there would not be a need for the Marbecca workshops, this for the getting song. what you're worth message, for everything that you work with people on a regular basis. You wouldn't have been able to just step right out of the box if it was just one thing. I completely get that. And, and, and one of the reasons why we're so excited to have you a part of Mobile Beat Las Vegas, and uh, Mark's going to be speaking uh, to, the first, uh, for the, to, to the first part of that Tuesday show. Mm -hmm. uh, everything starts on Monday, and he's the first uh, presenter on on tuesday yeah. starting i think around 10 30 in the morning mm -hmm. and uh and we're i mean i'm looking forward to seeing the the tie choice you make um uh mostly yeah will it be blue or <laughs> will he go for the red again will this be a, a it, mixture it'll, of it'll both kind of maybe. set the tone for like what's coming at us with we'll watch for the tie so we're not going to ask you what you're going to talk about. Or we, I, what color tie? One you're of the things, uh, I, I, what I want for those people who came come to Mobile Beat mostly is that they have the experience that I had the first time that I came to Mobile Beat when I was dumbfounded at every corner, and then the day that I stood uh, in that room after you were done and could not get to you just to shake your hand and go, "Wow." You've changed something in me. Mm -hmm. I want that kind of experience there at Mobile Beat this year, and and sh and I know for a fact that's why your that's why we wanted you to be a part of it. So I, I can't tell you how excited I am, and 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 I hope within this interview they kind of get an idea of of what that's all about. Well, Mark made it possible for you to charge what you charge now for uh -huh. you to see in yourself and take on that journey and take it on. And, and even myself, like following your influence, then the, the domino effect, without me, you would be nothing. Me. Exactly. Right. And without exactly. Mark, you would be, we would just be nothings <laughs> together. Well, that's what, and, and once again, you know, it sounds like I'm blowing smoke up his butt here, but you know, I, I, I've told him that on a regular basis that without him, without him, and he's regularly told me, told me, duh. No, he's regularly <laughs> said to me that, you know, it was, it's, you know, all he did was open the blinds, you know, uh, that, that it was always possible for me to be able to be, to be charging what I was charging. Um, now, creating mastery is where, where I got down to the nitty gritty mm -hmm. around the, the mentor that he became for me. And, and I know that he is for other people. So he opened the door and you stepped in. I'm saying baby, Mark, I can't wait for us to see you get together, hear you speak, be a part of the show, work together. It's just going to be, it's going to be the best coming up in February. I just, I can't wait beside myself. Don't forget Las Vegas.
Yeah. This mobile beat show is going to be one for the history books. Uh, I, yes. I have such a, a lot of excitement, a lot of trepidation about it, of course, because I know that a lot's riding on, on this show, on my shoulders for this show, and for you guys as well. But I have so much confidence in your abilities to to make this spectacular. Well, it's easy for us to do that because we know that it really is not on our shoulders. It really is on yours. Right. So <laughs> and so I'll, I'll you're, only you're... say one thing about about the speech that I'm going to give. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 not going to be a seminar. It's uh-huh. going to be a speech. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, at the end of my speech, I'm going to have a 50 gallon drum of kerosene Ooh. next to me and a big lighter in my pocket. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. Can we let's we should talk about moving him to Thursday. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> That'd be a hell of a way to leave the Riviera, man. <laughs> right. right. We were being metaphorical, Mark. <laughs> we're burning that. down the giant. <laughs> hey, now, thanks again for being a part of the Bill and Jason show. Oh. Uh, we'll see you next week. If you haven't tweeted us on Twitter, be sure to do that. If you haven't right. liked us on Facebook or gone to our website or or called up Jason uh, uh, just, to, just to tell him how much you like me, we say bye. be sure you do that. Okay, see you later. Broadcasting from high atop planet Earth at a rate of 96 kilobytes sample per second over the interweb in an effort to stop glorifying being busy. This has been an entertainment experience production.